Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Lee Brown and you're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate and we exist over here for your listening pleasure and frankly because there's not really a good place for the regular world to understand what realtors, mortgage lenders, inspectors, title companies, what we go through in the process of helping people with real estate because it looks really easy from the outside but from the inside It's a whole different scenario. So today I'm bringing y'all a guest. You've never heard from her on the podcast before, but you're going to be so glad you're a loyal subscriber because we are going to welcome Candy Owens to the show. Candy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Lee. Hi, everybody. All right. So tell our friends out there that are listening where you're located, how long you've been in and around real estate or whatever tidbits that would give them some background and insight on you. I am in Chapel Hill. I am with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, York Simpson Underwood. Came to them through the Prudential route, which is where I started, and through mergers and stuff. Here we are in Metamont, which is where our office is located in Chapel Hill. So I work in the Triangle and have been in the business for about 10 years, full time for about eight first two years, I still had kids at home. So I was just kind of just trying to learn and do it part time, helping other people doing open houses for them, working with their clients when they were on vacation. But it gave me a good chance to learn the business and see how different people ran their businesses. So I could know what I liked and what I didn't like. And that's actually interesting, because you'll find that a lot of the top professional realtors out there even if they didn't start in that kind of part-time capacity, they had that same opportunity to be with a mentor in some way, shape or form. And frankly, I would guess you'd agree with me on this. I really don't know how anybody makes it in real estate without somebody there to either give them some guidance, give them some advice or give them that opportunity to take signs out and learn from them because the business You have to learn it on your feet. You don't learn it in licensing class. I absolutely agree. And I still have a coach, Lee, that I sit down with once a month. It's an old Bic of mine. And I went to him and said, will you be my coach? And we have an ongoing relationship because I need somebody to hold me accountable and to bounce ideas off of. And by the way, if you're a normal person listening to this, a big is a broker in charge. And so the way that our offices work, realtors in most cases are brokers. In North Carolina, everybody with a license is a broker, not the same in other states, but there's going to be somebody supervising. And not all realtors are going to take that huge step that Candy did of saying to somebody, I need you to work with me because... It's, it takes a lot of humility to admit that you need somebody to help hold you accountable, but it also, golly, it makes us better at this business and it makes us better human beings when we allow other people to help hold us accountable. It's huge. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so a decade in the business. Yes. You see a lot of things. And of course, in Chapel Hill, you have a whole bunch of different micro markets. If you are not from North Carolina, and you're racking your brain trying to figure it out, that's the home of the Tar Heels, you know. We call it Chapel Thrill, those of us that went to school there. But you've got a university micro market. You've got the Governor's Club, Country Club World, Metamont's its own village. You've got Farrington Village. You've got old houses, new houses, condos. And so that means when I ask you what you've seen in real estate, you could probably go in a million different directions. But let's just say you are hanging out on campus, showing a client where their precious pumpkin is going to go to college. And they look at you and they say, Candy, what in the world is Chapel Hill real estate like? What do you tell them? What is the story that they would never expect? Our reality right now in Chapel Hill is that the town of Chapel Hill and the town of Carver, which have grown together into one big town, There's not a lot of land left for development. So we have an aging inventory. We don't have a lot of new construction right here in town. All the new construction is going on south of us in Chatham County. And that is the real reality of our market. 
Well, that's an interesting way to think about it because I think about when I was there, they were just building Farrington when I was at Carolina. And it was all new. And Carborough was just a hippie village. Exactly. Pittsburgh yeah. had a, well, I lived in Carborough because it was cheap then. You know, it was cheaper than Chapel Hill because you were so far out. But you fast forward a, a quarter of a century and you realize that there really isn't anywhere to go unless you go way out. But then you've also got some pretty onerous regulatory environments in the Chapel Hill area. So has that been an impact on where you could do new construction? Absolutely. That is the huge elephant in the room. And even though people have tried to address that with the powers that be over the years, it still remains the biggest obstacle. And in some ways, I can respect what they've done. They have said we have X number of seats in the schools and you cannot do a building adventure that's going to put 200 or 250 kids in schools where there are not seats for it. They're right. not going to let that happen. And that has been one of the of our, you know, restrictions that we've had to deal with over the years. Well, it's definitely one of the sides of real estate that I don't think realtors know anything about when they go get the license. But our buyers and sellers who come home to their houses and go to work and come home to their houses don't understand that there is a macro picture out there that is absolutely impacting their day-to-day lives because you do have to balance school populations and you have to balance infrastructure and roads and you have to balance who's going to pay for what. And realtors are in a very unique position because we understand, if you're paying any attention at all, you understand how those local elected officials are making decisions that impact the houses not just that we're listing and selling to people, but that our clients live in for five years and 10 years. And I think that's a a piece the public needs to understand. And it's why if you are like a normal person listening to this and not a realtor, you absolutely need to ask your realtor if they're paying attention because the realtors who aren't could be doing you a disservice if they don't understand the machinations of that local government. And the realtors who are listening to this If you're not going to town council meetings and school board meetings to know exactly why is Candy talking about how that's impacted school seats, you've got to be in that room because we get it in a way that's so different than one family here and one family there because we deal with a lot of families. Yeah, there's nothing more frustrating than have someone say to you, I bought this house thinking my kids were going to go to school X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. And that's not where they're in school. It's not that hard. But people are relying on you for that kind of information. And as a realtor, man, that is just elementary. You have to know that stuff. Yes. And we have to teach the public to ask these questions because there's so many out there who, when they hear the word politics, they think federal D.C. level stuff, forgetting that it's the local politics that are so impactful immediately. And you're a realtor out there. You don't have the luxury of turning this off. You just don't. And you're the one that could be held liable, frankly, if you don't have the knowledge that your competitors do have. But we apparently could go on about this for some while. But anytime I talk to a friend in Chapel Hill, it's really evident because you have one of the more stringent regulatory environments of anywhere not just in North Carolina, but in the country. And so with that being said, back to your aging stocks that we have a trail here. So you've got aging stock issues. Talk to me about what that means in your business and that couple that we were talking about at the old will. How do you explain this to them? If they're going to be in town, which is your location, your location, your location, they're not going to have a new house. They're not going to have a house with probably granite or updated bathrooms, huge walk-in showers. I mean, you're going to end up in a house that if you want that, you're going to have to put it in. If you want that, if that's your desire, then we're going to be in the car and we're going to be driving out of town. So basically, you're telling them to quit looking at Pinterest if you're going to buy a property in town. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Don't get your hopes up. Right. Okay, so that being said, you take that couple out. Tell us some of the scenarios that you've encountered out there showing and selling property and what you have encountered that you would never have anticipated after going to licensing school all those years ago. 
Well, the one funny one that I had one time was up in Hillsboro. And I was showing a couple. They had been looking in Hillsborough for a long time. They were in temporary housing. And a house came on the market that morning. And I called her and I said, we need to see this today. This house is in an upscale neighborhood and it is priced to go. So she calls husband and we decide to meet there at lunch. So there we are. I pick her up and we go there and he meets us. And the house was on the market. The for sale sign was not even up. There was a lockbox on the door. So we go in the house. We've been in the house about 20 minutes and the doorbell rings. We're in the kitchen and the couple looks at me and said, well, I said, I'm going to answer that. And they said, OK, we'll go out and check out the backyard. So I go to the door and there's a deputy sheriff and a very nicely dressed lady with a clipboard and a lanyard around her neck with a bunch of credentials. And she starts talking and I am focused. Sometimes maybe I'm not quick on the pickup but I am focused totally on the deputy and my mind is going to, I have set off an alarm. I didn't hear an alarm. There wasn't any alarm information on the showing instructions, but obviously here's a deputy. I've triggered something. So she's talking her little talk, talk about who she is and what she's with and, you know, where she's coming from. And I'm not paying any attention to her. I'm looking around the door frame, trying to see if there's a keypad I didn't punch. So finally, when the when she stops talking, I look at the deputy and say, I set the alarm off, didn't I? And he's like, I don't know. And then I'm like, well, then why are y'all here? <laughs> Then she says, are you so-and-so? And And I said, no, I'm not. And they kind of cut their eyes at each other like, yeah. And then she said, well, I just, I need to serve eviction papers on you. And I'm I'm like, wait, no, I don't live here. And I said, I'm a realtor. And they're like, yeah, right. And then she goes in to see, you know, this is where I need you initial. This is where, and I said, I can't (sighs) sign for this. I don't live here. So finally, I decide that if I go get my clients and bring them to the door, that we can work all this off when they see that I'm actually a realtor showing the house. So I can go wait here. So I go get my clients out of the backyard, bring them to the door. And now the deputy and his sweet little friend have decided that this is the couple that lives in the house. Oh, geez. So they start trying to serve them with the papers and they are very confused. So to work it all out, we had to get our driver's license out. They had to call. They called my office and made sure that I was who I said I was. They actually asked the people at the office Do you know what kind of car she drives? So they could see if that indeed was the car that was parked there at the house. They called my client's husband's. um, They called the husband's work and verified his employment off of, you know, to see if he was who he was. So that made for a very interesting phone call after that showing where I had to call the listing agent and say, you've got a big problem here because the deputy is trying to evict your homeowners from this house. The house was empty. They had already moved out. But that was probably one of the more interesting things that has ever happened to me. So how long did it take your heart rate to go back to normal? Because I would be in a panic the whole time. Well, I was, especially when she's, and she was not going to take no for an answer, Lee. She was going to serve those papers on me. You know, we were just going to stand there until I started initialing and signing. There's no way I could do that. Even if I had been a listing agent up there doing photographs or something, you know, she couldn't have signed for it. It took Probably from the time that they rang the doorbell till they got in the little deputy car and left, I bet they were there for 45 minutes or an hour. They checked everything. They stood out in the front yard and talked. They really were not convinced that we weren't the people that they really needed to give this paperwork to. And it took a long time for us to convince them that we were innocently there looking at the house. You realize there's a gap here about how much time they spent trying to convince themselves that you were the person they could serve because they wanted to sign and go back to work without realizing that none of y'all were the right people and not even thinking about the realtor being at a house. Oh, yeah. Just such a disconnect. You know, show my driver's license, show my real estate license, they call the office, you know, just 
and, and then the same was good thing enough. with both the other, both the client and her husband, same thing, driver's license, verification of who you are. It was amazing. So did your clients buy that house, by the way? They did not. <laughs> <laughs> Bad mojo at that point. Well, it was priced to go for a reason. I'll just say Apparently that. Apparently so. <laughs> okay, so if we have anybody listening to the show, and they need a professional realtor who does all the things the right way. Because by the way, I got to point out to y'all, Candy had her driver's license with her. She had her real estate pocket card with her. And North Carolina requires you to have it. Even though there's a digital version, it's supposed to be saved on your device so you can show people that you have an active license. So she's doing things the right way, including not running from the deputy. So high five for not running away, even though you probably wanted to. So if anybody wants that kind of a professional realtor who can calmly and methodically get you out of the deputy's eyesight without letting you sign eviction papers for a house you don't own. Candy, how can they find you in the Chapel Hill and Triangle area? It is Candy period Owens with an S at BHHSYSU.com or my cell number is 919-698. Nine four two seven, And it's okay, people, because we all understand that when a company has gone through that many mergers and acquisitions, the name gets really long. It's okay, because all of Candy's information is in the show notes for this episode. And you can click on her email or you can call her anytime and she'll give you great service in Chapel Thrill. And by the way, if you know somebody who does have a child that's planning to attend the nation's first state university, Candy can help you figure out where you can purchase something for them to live in for four years because even though real estate's expensive, room yeah. and board is out of control. So don't forget about university housing when you are becoming an empty nester. Oh, we do that every year. We go through that period. Yep. If I Where's my child going to live? I wish I could have afforded it then. We didn't have a ton of money, but I was a roommate for a girl whose parents did buy her a townhouse down across from the Chapel Hill Police Department. Yes. And a guy that I was dating at the time then got arrested for getting drunk and driving by the Chapel Hill Police Department doing a drive-by <laughs> shooting on it. That's probably a story I should tell on a different podcast episode because that was a that wasn't real estate. That was crazy life in college in the era before <laughs> devices and digitals. But look, Candy can help you get through those situations too. So you should reach out to her at any time. And I appreciate you for coming on the podcast and reminding agents don't sign papers just because the deputy comes to the house because it might not be you. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Lee. It was nice to talk to you. All right, friends. If you have any stories you'd like to share, you're a realtor, broker, investor, inspector, lender, or a normal human being who has lived through a real estate transaction and you'd like to tell your story, hit me up at Lee Brown on Twitter to be featured in a future episode or any of the social networks. Subscribe for more and we'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time. <laughs>